This since I've, I've lasted long enough. Long enough. They cause irreparable damage. They cause irreparable damage. Country. Do COVID, de todos os países. The COVID question. All the countries join together. While all the other countries join efforts to fight the pandemics, I had a choice. I had a chance to to get together with the Cuban government. And while all the other countries join efforts to join to, to fight to find one solution, Cuba was working in five vaccines. That small country, a vaccine against COVID, for chronic a A vaccine for younger people before they reach six years old, a vaccine for the older ones. Cuba was in the front line in the exercise of saving humanity. So we have to question a country that gives itself such a cause, why? Why is humanity harassing Cuba, punishing Cuba, culturally, financially? I know that this journey is not dedicated to Cuba, but Cuba is a clear illustration that our fight makes sense and we have an ideology behind it. Nobody follows a party, nobody follows a politician for, for the simple reason you like it. The masses follow the parties if the parties have an ideology, if they have a proper purpose, if they have a mission. mission. This meeting should allow us to renew our goal and having ideas, a purpose, and give the most of us to fight the unfairness, fight, fight to protect the human rights for all. All human beings should have access to human rights. I would like to finish Thanking our youth, our women, our ideology school, for having the opportunity for once again da Milka Cabral, in, the, in the house of Amilcar Cabral, PAGC, to renew the commitment de to all our fights, to all our energies, so that the Pan-Africanism can be used against neocolonialism to promote justice, é com estas to palavras, ensure that justice will prevail. I would like to declare aberto, openly o nosso simposio, our symposium uh, international, international and we hope that during this our journey we can learn from other comrades. Mas que somos todos cidadãos do mundo, We're e all citizens of the world. Muito our commitment is for the commitment is for all. Thank you very much. Muito obrigado, camarada presidente.
Agora vamos chamar. Thank you very much, my dear president. Now we are going to invite our facilitator, Ana, who will be uh, facilitating the first panel of this symposium. I don't know if she's uh, here, if she can hear me. Can you hear? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So, revolutionary greetings. Africans and all our allies, I'd like to welcome you to the panel on Pan-Africanist movement, fight against neocolonialism. For many years, we have been deluded to believe that Africa is independent. But in reality, what was achieved in the late 1950s right up to the 1990s was flag independence. From that time, African countries have had their economies and their political policies controlled by their former colonial powers through various neo-colonial mechanisms. As we begin our commemorations for the year 2020, African Liberation Day, this panel on Pan-Africanist movement fight against neo-colonialism presents evidence of a struggle that still continues, but of a certain victory anchored in Pan-African ideology. We have a number of people who will be speaking from Guinea-Bissau, the Western Sahara, and we had a presenter from Eritrea, but unfortunately, he's unable to make it. And we'll also hear from the Cuban ambassador. To kickstart this African Liberation Day panel presentation, I'll begin by inviting the Secretary General of the African Party for Independence of Guinea-Bissau to speak to us about the struggle against neocolonialism in a very hotly contested zone. I believe in his presentation he will also be able to highlight some of the linkages between neocolonialism and some reactionary nationalist movements attempting to solve neocolonial problems. I believe it's comrade Dionysio, and I'd like to welcome you to begin. Thank you. Um, before you begin, you have about 10 minutes to make your presentation and one minute towards the end, I'll be able to let you know so that you can make your concluding statements. You're welcome.
seems we're having technical difficulties. But I believe we should be able to get on soon. Is the MC there? Are you able to hear me? MC, are you able to hear me? I believe the audio seems to be, we seem to be having an audio problem. Uh, just bear with us for a minute as we try to solve it. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Is our, our first presenter ready? Okay. okay. Yes, we're having our first presenter from the... Yes, I believe it's the Secretary General okay. of AAS. Uh, yeah. Mais uma vez, uh, mais uma vez, boa tarde. E nós vamos. Good afternoon again, and we will share. Uh, in name of Guinea, we are going to share the experience uh, that we are having this year because this year, uh, the commemoration of this uh, this country. Each country has ten minutes to share their experiences and struggle against neocolonialism. The thing uh, that was given to Guinea-Bissau has to do with the countries that uh, have proclamated the state, but are still actually, they're still actually struggling for the consolidation of their independence. First, our uh, reflection about, uh, uh, about the thing that was proposed to us is that one of the problems that we have in Africa, which is also uh, the case of Guinea, is that the countries, the states that were implemented by the colonial power were not states to serve the people, uh, to serve to the African people. Those states were uh, had as a goal, as the main goal was to explore the African people. Uh, and to uh, explore the people who were part of the colon colonizing country. They were not uh, here to serve the interests of the people. They were here to serve to the interests from Lisboa. So that's why Amico Carbaro used it to say, our struggle 
uh, didn't have, it was not necessary to have a flag or an anthem or just proclaim a state, but uh, also essentially change the conditions of our population. Uh, we need to change our economic uh, conditions, give people's access to education, education which was denied to our population. We need to transform our economy. Uh, we need to be uh, the owners of our own economy. But unfortunately, many countries, just like in Edisau, we cannot uh, organize this state uh, which is able to answer to these needs, to meet these needs. What happens is that many countries like Guinea, uh, I have no audio. Many countries tried to adapt and to end the colonial state that was uh, going on in the time. They tried to adapt a model that we are having problems in making this state work. Our struggle today to, uh, to uh, reach independence has to do with that, with the way we started. We have a state which was proclaimed without a nation, without a context. Uh, many countries, for example, Europe, uh, many continents, after the Second World War in Europe, we could understand that uh, the European society is almost homogeneous. So in this society, it is too easy to implement democracy. It is much easier to implement the state, uh, a solid state, because there is a nation. I have no audio, I cannot hear. We have been challenged in uh, the context of Guinea Bissau. Uh, these oh. works really well, yes, to a different nation. But here in Guinea, we still don't have a nation. We can call it uh, a smaller nation. So uh, we actually need to unify and become uh, a big Guinea, Guinea nation. Of course, this struggle has not been easy because as we still live, uh, under a context of neocolonialism, which means the domination, the indirect domination, uh, the social domination, the military domination. This struggle has not been easy because of these issues. Because today, uh, besides Guinea-Bissau is independent, besides we, uh, we have our own flag, uh, besides, we have formed our own government. We are still uh, not independent, politically independent. We are not uh, economically independent. We are not militarily uh, independent because we still depend on the colonizers. They are the ones who run our economy. Uh, so our economy de depends directly on their economy. Our military system also depends on the colonizers. We always rely, and this makes it difficult uh, for us to organize as a state, because the contribution, uh, the, the way of production that Amuka Cabral was used to say, uh, which is the, the struggle for liberation, that we need to have control of our ways of production and economy. Uh, this is still uh, very distant for our country, uh, as well as to many other African countries. But we understand that with this struggle, we are sure that Guinea-Bissau is not an alone. We need to intensify the cooperation with other countries, which has been going uh, through the same problems as Guinea. We also have uh, to cooperate, and we also have uh, been cooperating uh, with other countries who also struggled uh, for liberation like Mozambique, 
Nigeria, as well as countries in uh, African America, in South America, uh, like Venezuela, Cuba, in uh, Central America. We also believe that Guinea um, will never be able to eradicate neocolonialism uh, alone. Uh, we need to have a coordination among the countries, especially uh, in the moment we are living, in terms of economic uh, uh, economic imperialism has explored uh, many countries in Latin America, Africa, and today many governments uh, are struggling to uh, uh, use their own resources because of cap uh, financial capitalism. Uh, we live in a time, yes, where uh, resources generate money. But today, we live under a system where money generates itself. The working labor uh, the bourgeoisie to invest in industry to generate jobs no longer do that. Uh, they want to uh, invest all monies in other types of ways. And this is a common reality among the African countries. So that's why we believe it's necessary to have a cooperation, a coordination, support to, especially to the country who are in need or who need to be supported, which is the case of Guinea, to fight neocolonialism. We need to make it clear that when we talk about neocolonialism, we are not talking about uh, we're not only talking about the European countries which colonize us. Unfortunately, we have been having problems with some other African countries who also want, that also want to follow this unfortunate past of exploit, ex exploiting our own people. It is necessary for our partners to be attentive to this, to pay attention to this which uh, that some African countries are being used as a tool like I said, some countries have been using as a tool of other imperialist countries to exploit their own brothers and sisters in Africa. We also have to fight against this practice. I won't uh, take too long. I would like to say thank you to the facilitator, Hana Anna, and say that uh, Guinea, the PAGC, which is a Pan-African uh, party, is, wants to uh, keep this struggle, continue this struggle, not only to liberate Guinea, but also to help the, with the liberation of other African countries. Just like happened in the past, The agency is open uh, to work with all the movements and all partners uh, aiming at making uh, Guinea and Africa a continent which is truly independent uh, economically, militarily, and politically. Thank you. very much. Thank you very much for your presentation.
and for mentioning some of the very important you know components about pan-africanism which involves and is very much anchored in the solidarity of african people and how victory lies in the collaboration of the african masses and how no one single individual country can do it on its own i would like to right now call our second presenter of this panel and i'd like to call upon the cuban ambassador to speak to us about their experience with neo-colonialism and what kind of strategies they have used to be able to build a solid force against colonialism and to speak to us too about their alliances with the Pan-Africanist movement. You're welcome. The ambassador of Cuba to share the Cuban experience, the fight against colonialism and neocolonialism. Buenas tardes a todos. Excelentísimo señor ingeniero Domingo Simón Pereira, presidente del Partido Africano para la Independencia de Guinea Bissau y Cabo Verde. Estimados vicepresidentes que nos acompañan en la tarde de hoy, combatientes de la libertad que nos honran con su presencia en este acto. Dirigentes y jóvenes, leaders and young people of Pan-African youth, Amil Calcaurán, estimated com comrades. First, I want to appreciate all of the organizers of this event for, li for African Liberation Day for inviting me here to speak some words on behalf of my town. My comrades. It's a great source of pride for the Cuban people to celebrate Africa's day and to commemorate the 59th anniversary of the Constitution, the 25th of May, in 1963. United once again, we come together to bring together unity in the, of all the different countries on the continent for development and inclusion. Africa's Day is a date that reflects the recent history of the African continent, characterized by an interesting discourse of unification and of recognition of the African culture that was marked during more than 400 years by phenomenon like slavery, the transatlantic slave trade, 
and the cultural importance of this commemoration is not just rooted in the recognition, the historical recognition of the African plurality, but also it has an interesting mark for finding alternative solutions to problems like racism and the way the contemporary ways that we see slavery today. In any ways, they focus their agenda towards the unification and the culture and the recognition of African people. Well, According to statistics, the African population has represented 15% of the world population. And even though there are Afro descendants in every single continent of the world, we estimate that the majority of them are found in the United in America, Central and primarily in the United States, Colombia, Venezuela, Panama, the islands in the Caribbean like Haiti, the Republican the Dominican Republic, Jamaica and Cuba. Africa is part of the essence of our of our nation. And for these reasons, Cubans are motivated to commemorate Africa's day. Africa and Cuba There's audio connection issues. los africanos porque aunque lo que tenemos la piel un poquito blanca because while we have paler skin we know that in our blood we have african blood no se puede comprender en su we cannot understand the great magnitude the deepness of which is Cuba and Africa's relationship and our presence in this continent without the consciousness of African courts to Cubanism. Africanism is an essential part of Cubanism, and which is why the, the executive in, in chief, Fidel Castro, always said in moral debt and in the will of conversation that we have with Africa, we Cubans have with Africa. And in that sense, in Mandela Park, 
in Jamaica, el día 30 de julio de 19... in Jamaica uh, 30th of July 1928 started referring to itself as the noble effort of the town, the Cuban town in favor of African liberation said and I cite and I quote what, what were we doing if not paying our debts with those that fought for our independence in many battlegrounds this is what we've done we don't deserve any type of special recognition. We don't deserve any type of special gratitude. We simply need, simply with Africa, we have met our, our duty. End of quote. And meeting that duty, almost a million Cubans fought against colonialism and for the independence. 2,289 of them found, paid the ultimate price with their lives, fighting for this continent. Cuba never, has never given Africa what they, what they have deserved. We have, and at a time insufficient. It was this way since the first moment in 1963. Our country had lost practically half of all of its doctors in the country on the island by 1959 and newly independentized, abandoned by almost every, every person, every And they were they were sending um, health care their audio issues and the medical collaboration the Cuban medical health fifty nine years after that. Ejemplo fehaciente, 36 años en la Facultad de Medicina, Raúl Díaz. 36 years in medical faculty, developing a program, an excellence program, that makes real young people's dreams and becomes, and becomes the star of our um, country's medical program. As countries diversify, we count on the firm support and unanimous support of the countries in Africa and the African Union. Africa is in solidarity with the, with the Cuban Revolution. And the approved revolution And with the government of the United States and North America. And as we signal here, we appreciate the president of the party 20 years ago, uh, more than 60 years ago. The dignity. Those that spoke in that forum declaring with sovereign firmness, the end. This effort we appreciate extraordinarily and the Communist Party of Cuba brought forward their eighth Congress in which there was a special thanks to uh, the African uh, support for this uh, battle against colonialism alongside the African continent. And this was the point of a relationship between brothers who today 
in this economic, political san uh, panorama we see today, colleagues, brothers and sisters, I would also like to offer some words from our leader, Fidel Castro, on the active and positioned in the order of good hope in the city of Kaos, South Africa, in 1968, in which he said, and I quote, the names of the roots, the common roots, and the common story that we today continue constructing in the name of all of those children of the subcontinent who were taken from their land, sold and chained, forced to cross the ocean and forced to give forward their sweat and their life in a faraway island that after all was a new land for them, a new, a new nation for them. Incountable legions of Africans and, this, and African descendants who fought and died now like Cubans for independence in the scene of millions of Cubans that one day returned to Africa to put their value and their blood at the service of the liberty of the continent. In the names of the thousands and thousands that have offered and today, and to, that have cheered and today cheer Africa. In the name of all of the, the whole Cuban village they learned to, to bleed with their solidarity and their internationalism, that debt toward that we had with Africa. We say today, may Africa Day live. May African liberation uh, live. Cuba has been and will be a true friend of the continent, Afri of the African continent. May the friendship and between Africa and Cuba, uh, may that live forever. Between Africa, Cuba, and Binagisao, until until victory, victory or death. Um, it's kind of difficult to hear what I'm saying. Obrigado, obrigado. Obrigado, obrigado. Camarada, embaixador. De Cuba. The key comrade, Cuba ambassador. Thank, thank you, the students from Cuba. Now we're going to follow with our activity. And we would like to remind you that this international symposium in is one of the activities which makes allusion to the commemoration of African Liberation Day, of, uh, which will be, will be tomorrow. Tomorrow we have a, 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 walk, a march, uh, and the meeting point is simply green space here in Guinea. Yes. And we go, we will go então, from a point to Xingá. Então, todos são, todos you are all invited. A partir da 16 horas. We will meet at 4 p.m. Oh no, it's 7. Manhã. Oh, 7 a.m. Okay. A concentração okay. a partir das 7 da manhã. We will meet at 7 a.m. and it will start 
start at 8. So we will leave from Shapa to Chehevara's Fair. We're all invited to be part of this event so we can uh, manifest to the world that we, just like other African countries, we still uh, have not surrendered to imperialism or new colonialism. But that the struggle uh, keeps going on, that Guinea and PAIG it keeps us strong in this fight. Vamos, uh, entregar os prêmios porque we will deliver ano, some uh, award because é every year that we organize uh, the celebration day, uh, the mother organization, AAPRP, which integrates many organizations. Uh, we usually choose and vote an award because we have been uh, struggling a lot for uh, the liberation of African people. Uh, Today we are going to have an award, Deborah, two né? awards. I will ask Deborah to, to approach here. Please approach. Então, nós temos uh, we have este this quadro, né? This picture, this frame, which is, like I said before, it's an award that we deliver yearly to some uh, important people who have been struggling and uh, making efforts to fight for African liberation. I'll ask the ambassador, uh, the Cuban ambassador, to come here again to give the, the, the award. Incansável camarada, to our comrade, President do Partido, Engineer, the President of the Party, Engineer uh, Domingo Simões Pereira. Porque a Guiné-Bissau teve, because Guinea has had, mais palmas. Okay, clap, please. Obrigado. Ah, uh, nosso presidente do partido, our president. Nós tivemos nós tivemos a sorte que we were lucky As enough to, to have uh, these two personalities, two people who were selected from me, the, uh, both uh, from organization. the organization. The organization of all African people, uh, of all African uh, people, is an organization which congregates uh, many organizations uh, worldwide. Uma, uma they voted uh, to select Africa. in Africa as, as comrades and people who have contributed for this Mas agora, struggle. Now, a sorte também, we are also lucky uh, ter a nossa camarada, to have our comrade, combatant de liberdade pátria. Mas, a very important comrade, uh, who is really well known in this organization. I remember that once we had, uh, we were together uh, with some uh, comrades from London and the Estes. If we knew comrade Teodora, comrade, uh, comrade um, no? Na Guiné Bissau parece que in Guinea, uh, it seems like sometimes many people don't have this information, but when we talk about Pan-Africanism, the organizations today, uh, for example, in Nigeria, they have a school 
Obrigado. Thank you. <laughs> Ok, obrigado, obrigado, camarada Mana, Dora, é um privilégio. E todos nós estamos you, alegres com um reconhecimento internacional. Não se trata, nós apenas aqui, It's not about, uh, estamos apenas a representar organizações internacionais. As an international organization. Devemos seguir. I think we all should follow this path, this example. A Amanda Teodora tem tem demonstrado, certo? Que lutar não depende da idade. Because struggling has nothing to do with age. Do gênero. Mas depende da idade. Being part of the struggle has nothing to do with gender, but with having a revolutionary man mind. Um sentimento solidário à causa. Agora em seguida eu vou pedir a a partir da Guiné do Sul. From here, from Guinea, we want to have Anna. Anna, can you take it? Mm, no, I, I, I think I am done. I think it's probably off to the MC. Uh, we, we're done with the, with the panel presentation and the awards.
Greetings, greetings Africans. Happy African Liberation Day. My name is Shukora Umi. Greetings Africans. Happy African And I am very happy and humbled to present today two awards on behalf of the Mawana Kayete Awards, Daughters of Africa. The first award goes to the National Union of Eritrean Women. And I wanna give you a little background about this organization. The National Union of Eritrean Women, NUEW, was established in 1979 as one of the mass organizations of the Eritrean People's Liberation Front. In its current form, the NE, excuse me, NUEW is an autonomous non-governmental organization dedicated to improving the status of Eritrean women. During Eritrea's liberation struggle, NUEW succeeded in organizing and encouraging women's participation in the war effort. Since independence in 1991, NUEW has continued to enhance the role of women by raising their political consciousness through literacy campaigns, credit programs, English language lessons, and other skills training. N E, excuse me, N U E W is administered by a headquarters office located in Asmara, as well as by regional offices located in six zones. Membership numbers over 200,000 women. Sources of income include monthly membership fees, grants and projects, and fundraising activities by members. The mission of NUEW seeks to ensure that all Eritrean women confidently stand for their rights and equally participate in the political economic, social, and cultural spheres of the country and share the benefits. This organization advocates for the following. The development of women's confidence in themselves and respect for one another and the raising of consciousness to ensure their rights in the political and legal systems. A second piece of advocacy is they advocate for laws that protect women's rights in the family, entitlement rights, and other civil laws. A third advocate point, equal access to education and employment opportunities, equal pay for equal work and equal rights to skills development, to promotion, improved access to adequate health care, paid maternity leave, and child care services. A fourth advocate point, the eradication of harmful traditional practices that endanger women's health and well-being. And a fifth, the reduction of poverty for Eritrean women and their families. The Eritrean women in government. In the national and regional assemblies, 30% of seats are reserved for women. Women compete against each other for the votes of both men and women. Women also run against men for the remaining 70% of seats. The NW, excuse me, the NUEW 
played a major role during the drafting of the Eritrean Constitution by organizing workshops and synthesizing women on the crucial issues that concern women. This organization has played and continues to play a key role in advocating for, monitoring, and evaluating the formulation, planning, and implementation of government policies and programs from a gender perspective. Let's give a round of applause for the NUEW organization. Congratulations, congratulations. Thank you for all your hard work. The All African People's Revolutionary Party is honored to celebrate you and we are so proud of you and we thank you for the work you are doing, not just for Eritrean women, but for Africans everywhere. Thank you so much for the work you all are doing and may you continue to work hard for Africans everywhere, especially African women. I will now take the honor and pleasure to give some background on our second awardee, Teodora Inacia Gomez of the PAIGC, who is also a recipient of the Moana Kayati Daughters of Africa Award. This year, Teodora, Teodora excuse me, has been deserving of this award based on her work and dedication to the total liberation and unification of Africa under scientific socialism. She grew up in Guinea-Bissau under the systems of Portuguese colonialism. And in 1962, she joined the PAIGC and its women's wing, the UDEMU. And she worked closely with Emil Carr and collaborated with him. The PAIGC believed that women had just as much rights as men. In Guinea-Bissau, the society was matrilineal, and so this helped to lead to the development of a strong women's wing inside of the PAIGC. She was militarily trained and commanded a unit of 95 women during the armed struggle against Portuguese colonialism. One of the women she fought alongside with was Tatina Silia, a matured hero of the anti-colonial struggle in Guinea-Bissau. In 1964, she received a scholarship and went to study in Ukraine. Also, she came back to Guinea, Conakry, in 1966 to become a teacher at a school and became its director from 1969 to 1971. After Guinea-Bissau became independent in 1974, she she helped to pass laws against female genitalia mutilation and other laws to help defend women's rights. In 1976, she was elected to represent the PAIGC as one of the four vice presidents in the Guinea-Bissau Soviet Union Friendship Association. Her work for the masses of African people is very extensive, but we especially want to mention the work she did with the All African Peoples Revolutionary Party starting in 1998. We had her on our Cultural Workers Bureau campaign and did a recruitment drive across the United Snakes of America. Then she also helped to organize our Women's Wing Conference of Revolutionary Pan-African Parties in Guinea-Bissau in 2000. 
She has continued to work with our party as a member of the PAIGC and the Women's Wing UDEMU over the years. To this day, she continues to work to build the PAIGC and the AAPRP, AACPC, and the AAPRA. Please help me give a round of applause to our comrade and sister, Teodora, Teodora excuse me, Anasia Gomez. Congratulations, comrade. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for the work that you have done. And let's give another round of applause to both of our Mawana Kayate awardees. Thank you so much. And viva la revolucion, join an organization working for justice. Amanda La Awetu. Thank you for that, Shakura. Greetings, applicants. Greetings, comrades. I hope all is well with everyone and their loved ones. My name is Fatai, and I have the wonderful honor of presenting to everybody here today the All African People's Revolutionary Party Legacy Award to none other than Comrade Ni Arde Oto. So here's a little bit about the All African People's Revolutionary Party Legacy Award. The AAPRP Legacy Award is given to our organizers who have given a lifetime in service to building the AAPRP and global pan-Africanism struggles. We thank them for their past and continued selfless work and sacrifice. They are the true cadres who inspire us and in generations to come. Now, here's a little bit about our comrade who will be receiving the award, about comrade Ni Arde Oto. So Comrade Niyade Oto was born in Ghana. Comrade Niyade Oto has been a consistent member of the All African People's Revolutionary Party since 1996, when he was a student at the University of Akron in Ohio, United States of America. After leaving the University of Akron, he returned to Ghana and became the first member of the Ghana chapter of the All African People's Revolutionary Party. He has been involved in organizing in many programs and events over the years, including African Liberation Day, the 50th anniversary of the Nkrumah's Handbook of Revolutionary Warfare, demonstrations against the bombings of Libya at the U.S. Embassy, and many more programs and events. We wish to take out the time to thank Comrade Ni Ardo Oto for his lifetime of service to the African masses and the All African People's Revolutionary Party. Forward, the African Revolution. Let's, let us all join hands and uh, praise Comrade Ni Arde Oto for all of their hard work. And we all strive and struggle to see a one unified socialist Africa. And with that, I will be passing. <sighs> I will be passing the award to passing the panel to the next person who will be up. Um,
I now will be passing the floor to Comrade Imani. Mm. Comrade Imani, whenever you are ready, you're up next. <sighs> Jesus. Comrade, it's an honor to have you here on screen. Would you like to accept the award? Happy African Liberation Day for all the delegates and those who have gathered on this historic day. Comrades, I'm deeply honored and grateful to have been chosen for the African Liberation Day Legacy Award this year, May. 19, May 2022. I know many others equally deserve this award. I thank you all for choosing me. I would like to dedicate this award to my biological family in Ghana and the diaspora my ideological family who are scattered throughout the world and especially the women's wing of the AAPRP, the All African Women's Revolutionary Union, who, educate, who educated the male members on child care, gender issues, relating to women and the triple oppression, race, sex, and class, which African women face daily. I salute all the comrades who we worked with for the struggle to achieve the goal of one unified socialist Africa but have crossed over to join our revolutionary ancestors, the sheroes and the heroes whose shoulders we stand on. To our young men, members, to our young members of the AAPRP, I want to tell you that the struggle we have engaged in is not a short distance race, but a marathon race of life. 
until Africa is politically and economically united, the struggle still continues. With these words, this, 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 with these few words, I humbly and graciously have accepted this noble award. Thank you again for the award. An onward march to one unified socialist Africa. That must be. Long live the AAPRP. Long live the AAURU. And long live all the revolutionary organizations and parties who are struggling to free themselves from imperialist domination. Forward ever and backwards never. Thank you. Hello. Greetings, Africans. We're still here. Um, we're experiencing a few technical difficulties, but next up, we're going to be moving to uh, the World Socialist Panel. We're very, very excited to bring that to you next. Um, give us a second to sort out these technical difficulties with this international webinar for um, African Liberation Day. Um, we'll be right back.
drum call announces something important is getting ready to happen. Whenever we hold a ceremony, an important event, the drum call announces the time to begin has come. We're here to honor our ancestors. Our ancestors are our people, our relatives, who have gone on, who have passed from this earth into another realm. Without our ancestors, we would not be where we are today. We are calling up on our ancestors who fought for us, who died for our freedom, who continue to fight on our behalf. We honor them and we thank them. All praise is due to Almighty God and the honoring of our ancestors. As I salute our ancestors from the four corners of the universe. We honor our ancestors and we pour the water into the ground. It's a libation to giving honor and thanks to all our ancestors. And as you listen to us do the libations honoring our ancestors, you should quietly be still and call out the names of all your ancestors. <laughs> We pour libation tambico and first we honor the creator, the most high, by the many names we know him by. And we say Ashe, which means so be it. Calling out our ancestors. Let's hear the names and you should call out the names of your ancestors. Kwame Ture. Stephen Biko. Winnie Mandela. Marcus Garvey. Moina Soa. Kwame Nkrumah. Marie Jean et La Moitier. Tatine Sela. Emil Cabral. Kwame Nkrumah. Ya Asantewa. Sekou Toure. Marcus Garvey. And the millions of women over thousands of years who have suffered oppression under patriarchal systems of human exploitation. Ashe. 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 We call out the names of the ancestors unknown. We say Ashe. Ashe. We call out the names of those that we don't remember. Ashe. Ashe. All our ancestors those. through the middle passage. Ashe. All those fortunate enough to be buried on the continent. Ashe. All those who await justice. Ashe. Those who are yet unborn. Ashe. That's it, the last one. Ashe. Ashe. As we Ashe. gave thanks to our ancestors, thanks to all our ancestors, we say Ashe. 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 Hello again, and happy African Liberation Day once more, everyone. As I said before, my name is Shukura Umi, and I am humbled and proud to facilitate our second panel for today. We are diving into Cuba, and more specifically, the world socialist movement and Pan-Africanism. We are privileged to have a few panelists with us today. 
So I'm gonna take a moment to honor our panelists Chance as well as Ajamu. And if you all could both take maybe about 12 seconds to introduce yourselves and the organizations that you belong to, that would be stupendous. And then I'm gonna start with our questions. So Chance, if you wanna go first, please, and then Ajamu. Yes, so first of all, thank you for having me on this wonderful panel and for being part of the African Liberation Day webinar that you guys are performing, uh, hosting. I'm so honored to be here. Uh, so my name is Chance Ahmed. I'm a Black Palestinian based in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I'm an, also an organizer with the Palestinian Youth Movement. And so I'm very excited to be here today and be a panelist. Thank you so much, Chance. We're really happy to have you. And Comrade Ajamu, if you can introduce yourself, please, and your organization. Thank you, thank you. My name is Ajamu Baraka. I am the national organizer with the Black Alliance for Peace. The Black Alliance for Peace is a revolutionary organization uh, committed to trying to uh, revive the traditional Black anti-war and anti-imperialist tradition. Thank you so much, panelists. I'm just so grateful and humbled that you all have joined us today. So I'm gonna start off with a question for Chance. You said that you were a member of the Palestinian Youth Organization. Can you talk to us, Chance, about why you decided to join this organization and why you think being in an organization is important for Palestinian revolution? Yeah, um, specifically for the Palestinian Youth Movement, uh, we have understood that uh, the role of youth as well, as well as the role of college students have really played an integral, integral uh, component uh, for those advocating for Palestinian liberation. Um, in the 1960s, it was uh, Palestinians in Cairo that would end up forming uh, the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization. Um, as well as uh, the General Union of Palestinian Students um, were also integral. Prior to uh, the 90s in organizing uh, across the world for Palestine. Um, so with that in mind, I think it's very integral that we as youth um, in the Palestinian youth movement take our position seriously um, because we are the ones who are going to carry on the struggle um, into the forefront. And we're the ones that really are going to shape this next um, era of Palestine. And we have the power to do that and control that destiny. So if you are a youth, I, I really think it's integral and important for you to be active, but also learn from uh, the decisions of our elders and those that came before us so that we can carry that legacy of liberation into the future. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chance. I, I'm, I identify as being a youth of the Young Pioneers Institute with the All African People's Revolutionary Party, so I definitely feel you and where you're coming from, and I appreciate your response. So Comrade Ajabu, I, I do wanna ask you the same question, but I'm gonna ask you if you can add on to that answer to this basic question that I wanted to put in. I wanna hear from you and ask, how can national liberations and socialist organizations, whether they have Africans or be mixed with other people, fight against neocolonialism and aiding in the African struggle against neocolonialism? And I can repeat that if you'd like. I have it. I have it. Thank you so much. Uh, I think that the first thing that has to happen is a recognition of common interests. That uh, for African people, um, we understand how we, in fact, became African people as a consequence of the uh, invasion of the Americas, the enslavement of our people, the production of enormous amounts of value that created what we see today and what they refer to as Western Europe and so-called Western civilization. 
all other colonized peoples who have had similar experiences and who recognize that we're not going to be able to realize peace, development, or societal transformation until we take back power from these European uh, criminals. So we recognize our common interests and we then recognize in order for us to realize our common interests in terms of our uh, targeting of the source of our, of our issues, of our suffering, then we can then move toward what we need to do to in fact realize those common interests. And we also, and so we know the only way we're going to take back power the only way we're going to be able to transform ourselves and our conditions is when we get into organizations, when we build powerful coalitions that concentrate our power, uh, and when we commit ourselves to a unswerving, uh, undying uh, fight uh, to the end, uh, understanding that uh, not only do we have our liberation uh, at heart, at the center of our, of our struggles, but the liberation of all those who are, in fact, uh, suffering under the heels of this common enemy of collective humanity. Thank you so much, comrade. I, I, I feel like my head is going to fall off my neck because I'm just nodding and I'm agreeing with you 100%. And I thank you for giving us a two-part, right? So you answered the first question that I asked, and then you also tied into why being in an organization is important. We're constantly trying to remind people everywhere who are oppressed, joining some organization that is working for justice is really gonna help all of us in terms of everyone getting their land back, whether it's indigenous people, Palestinians, whether it's Africans. So thank you so much. So I'm just gonna continue on. And so Chance, this next question is for you. What is the link between neo-colonialism and some of the reactionary nationalist movements attempt to solve the problems from it. And I'll ask that one more time. What is the link between neo-colonialism and some of the reactionary nationalist movements attempting to solve the problems from it? Okay, so I think that the biggest link um, that we see right now is whether uh, states especially these reactionary states. So um, specifically, I'm going to talk about states like Saudi Arabia, states like the UAE, Morocco, um, for example, uh, that are authoritarian in nature. And what they are attempting to do is consolidate their own power over region, over people and their own interests. And they believe that by doing that and aligning with the West, so specifically uh, countries like uh, the UK, um, also countries like America, that these will preserve their own material interests in these own in their countries. So this allows them to consolidate their own wealth, their own power, and also. Um, it allows them to enjoy a relatively, um, relatively, um, uh, quote unquote, peaceful life, um, because they are the ones that are outsourcing the oppression and they are the ones that are, we won't say on top, but they are in the good graces of those Western imperial forces. So, um, by doing this, they are allowed to maintain a system of privilege um, that allows them certain benefits. And so really, they understand that without the US and without Western powers, they have no power because their, their people that they are repressing, whether it is in the UAE, whether it's in um, these reactionary states are not with them. They are not allies of the people. So with that in mind, they must really hold on to their power and consolidate it. Otherwise, their people will go against them because we have an understanding that as Palestinians, most, most people are aligned with our cause and for national liberation. 
But what, but what's important is that these states, we need to push um, the people in these states to have a change um, so that those consolidating power can also have their own revolution against these oppressive regimes. Thank you so much, Chance. I yeah, it. I had another question in mind, but you already answered it about, about just why is it important for us to join forces? And I think you were just speaking to how these oppressive regimes are trying to tackle every single one of us, and to also make sure that we don't have access to our land, which equals power. So I thank you so much for that. So, Comrade Ajamu, I wanted to ask you. Okay, so how does the U.S. Intentionally work to solve divisions between colonized communities, and how can we overcome that in our fight towards Pan Africanism? Well, I think what the uh, what the colonizer does quite um, effectively is to, and Chance touched on this, uh, to uh, identify uh, elements of the colonized peoples that they then will um, shower with uh, privileges, uh, all kinds of material wealth, uh, and, and, and make them, and they also voluntarily do this themselves, but they become agents of colonialism. And not only do they become agents in the sense of they will exploit and oppress uh, their own peoples, but, but they will help to disseminate uh, ideals that, that justify those relationship that that the hierarchical relationship and justifies their collaboration with the enemies of of humanity so they play a very important role in confusing the masses of our people so what we have to do is in fact to engage in a politics that while we recognize the the commonality of various colonized people we also have to recognize that within those uh, colonized people are class collaborators. And so our, uh, our targeting and our struggle against these uh, class collaborators has to be absolute. It has to be uh, uh, unapologetic uh, because that's the only way we're going to be able to, to defeat this enemy. That we have an internal struggle and we have the external struggle. Both are connected by the fact that we are uh, struggling against one system, one colonial capitalist system. So that is how we attempt on the ideological plan to 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 counter that. Uh, but again, you know, material force uh, can only be overthrown uh, by material force. So we have to organize ourselves. We have to build transnational revolutionary structures, both in terms of how we continue to build a, a revolutionary Pan-African movement, but also how we build relationships between uh, that revolutionary Pan-African movement and other revolutionary peoples on this planet. We are in the majority. We are on the right side of history. The only thing that's holding us back right now is our lack of political clarity and our level of organization. And that's why these kinds of events, this, this uh, African Liberation Day, and I want to salute the consistency and the leadership of the All African People's Revolutionary Party for keeping this front and center, for giving us an opportunity to have these kinds of conversations and to, to revitalize or to rejuvenate ourselves, if you will, as we engage in the struggle, uh, as we are reminded of uh, all of our common uh, 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 allies, as we are exposed to people like our brother Chance, uh, who's involved in this the, the same struggle against a common enemy. These are the kinds of relationships we have to be made aware of. Our people have to be made aware of as we build this global revolutionary movement. That's right, Comrade Jamu. Absolutely, I agree, nine thousand percent. And that's that's what I've been trying to tell folks is that this is the beauty of the all of African Liberation Day, is it allows us to be exposed to different groups that are oppressed, and then we get to hear from them and hear their stories and see how more aligned we are and separate. So thank you for that. So you all have been outstanding, and I'm so grateful that you have chose to share your time with us today. 
I do need to pass it on to my comrade, but I just, I think we can squeeze in time for one more question from both of you. So I'm actually gonna go to Comrade Ajamu first chance and then you'll wrap it up for us if that's okay. So Comrade Ajamu, if you could just briefly, please just talk to us about AFRICOM, USA and the military command, and then I'll pass it to Chance with my last question. Thank you both for your time. And yeah, thank you for your, your wonderful uh, moderation. Uh, and, and this opportunity to mention very briefly, one of the structures we have to struggle against, uh, which is this US Africa Command, or referred to as Africa. This is one of the structures of white power, of white supremacy, that uh, the US is using to try to maintain its uh, control, um, its ability to, to, to exploit our people uh, as the cutting edge of, of collective imperialism under the hegemony of the U.S. The, Afri the U.S. Africa Command is the command structure for the African continent. It is the structure that, that they use to train uh, uh, African uh, armies, to identify uh, African collaborators, uh, to uh, corrupt African uh, leaders that, and that will allow for AFRICOM to participate in their territories. Uh, to establish uh, African, to establish U.S. bases, uh, to engage in activity that um, results in in destabilization, that results in increase uh, in violence. Uh, they will uh, work with their CIA. They will create situations on the ground in Africa that then will compel some African leaders to to invite Africom in to help them fight against. Uh, so jihadists or whatever. Uh, all of this is geared toward uh, deepening the U.S. involvement on the African continent. We have a, pro a project right now at the uh, Black Alliance of Peace uh, to shut down AFRICOM campaign as part of our campaign uh, in, in support of the struggles, the liberation struggles on the African continent, helping to identify those structures uh, that we need to struggle against and to in fact struggle against those uh, those structures. So. AFRICOM, everybody needs to be aware of this uh, and they need to uh, figure out how they can help us to raise the awareness among our people uh, throughout the African world of this structure uh, and to encourage our people to help us to target uh, and in fact to destroy this, which means again targeting the neo-colonial puppets uh, that collaborate uh, with this uh, uh, imperialist structure. Thank you, comrade. Thank you so much, comrade Jamu. Okay, Chance, how can Palestinians confront neocolonialism? Can you give us some examples of how you all are working to address neocolonialism, please? Yeah, um, thank you for your question. I think uh, one of the ways that we can confront neocolonialism um, is by tackling issues such as increased securitization issues such as surveillance, um, as well as understanding that we are still engaged in an anti-colonial uh, struggle as well. Um, so when we look at um, uh, securitization and surveillance, what we really see, um, especially uh, in the United States, is seeing that um, Israel as the Zionist entity will use a lot of these colonial tactics and then export them um, all over the world. Not, not just in the United States, but for all these authoritarian and um, oppressive uh, governments that we see. So by using, by tackling this, um, the Zionist entity's use of uh, neocolonialism, uh, it, it establishes uh, an opening for a united front for all of us to tackle um, our, our colonizer and our common oppressor. Because Zionism is not just uh, a threat to Palestinians, but it is a threat to all of those uh, around the world um, as an issue of white supremacy, as an issue of colonialism, as imperialism, because it affects all of our communities. And so when we look at surveillance, um, we see that, um, especially in California, there was a whole campaign uh, dedicated to stopping Urban Shield, where um, uh, Israeli officials would come in and train 
not just uh, U.S. Uh, law enforcement, but they would also train uh, uh, law enforcement from around the world. So exporting these colonial tactics. So by tackling issues such as this, uh, by stopping uh, the deadly exchange, which is the police and law enforcement program specifically within the United States uh, in Israel that exchange by tackling issues such as that, um, by calling out the New York Police Department, which has its own branch in Israel, um, we could tackle these issues of neocolonialism and move forward and strike a blow to our, our oppressors. Um, and this is what we need to do. We need to highlight these, these, um, these commonalities and move forward because this is what is going to bridge the gap between uh, the Palestinian struggle and also the Pan-African struggle. Because we have to understand that if our, if our uh, colonial, uh, uh, our colonizers and these imperialist forces are in solidarity and in, with each other, we need to be in joint struggle with each other against them. And so in order, if we are to achieve liberation, we need a united front to tackle that. And so, um, as my comrade just said, we are, we, there's more of us, but we need to do that. We need to do that education and we need to do that organ, organizing around that so we could um, uh, hopefully in the near future be victorious and see a liberated uh, world for all of our peoples. All have done an outstanding job. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We are so grateful for your time today, and we hope to see you next year at ALD 2023. Thank you all again so much, and forward, may the revolution continue. Thank you all so much for your time. And so now I have the pleasure and privilege of passing the mic to my comrade Salifu, who is going to introduce two presentations on behalf of the Pan-African Congress of Azania and the Azanian People's Organization. Salifu, the mic is yours. Thank you so much, Shakura. Thank you so, so much. Greetings, Africans. Greetings, comrades. Greetings, collaborators. I'm very excited about today's African Liberation Day. Um, Symposium, very excited that you all are here. Uh, my name is Salifu and I am humbled to introduce our keynote presenters for African Liberation Day 2022. So we are about to hear from none other than our comrades of the Pan-African Congress of Azania, PAC, and the Azanian People's Organization, Azapo. This is a very special keynote because as many of you know, in February, these two organizations, which have historically been so important to our people's liberation struggle, came together to craft a declaration of cooperation agreement, which cements their intent, intent to forge cooperation and pulling together of expertise with a view to advancing the revolution for the attainment of one Azania nation. The PAC and Azapo are current day examples of principled African unity in practice, and I could not be more excited to introduce them today. We will hear from Jackie Saroke, lifelong cadre of the PAC, as well as the president of Azapo, Nelvis Kekima. So without further ado, our keynote, keynote presentation, uh, so without further ado, our keynote presenters for the day, PAC and Azapo. Wow. These are it. Um, I'm the secretary for publicity and information in the National Executive Committee of the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azari. We, in the PAC, adopted Pan-Africanism as a guiding philosophy of our organization. And in doing so, the founders of the organization were inspired by the worldwide movement, uh, particularly the, the leadership of Pan-Africanism um, as represented by the ideas of uh, 
the Osak here for coming in. The OKC in the peak is wrote from the wrote from the mainstream of politics in South Africa as explained and understood by the old guard in the Congress movement. The old guard accepted that South Africa was a was exceptional from the rest of the of the country. The, the African grouping uh, that adopted African nationalism as a guiding philosophy felt that this meant the organization was not in line with the conditions of um, their people throughout the world. And, and their people were their own liberators. And, and the same applies to the confines of uh, racist South Africa. Um, these debates created a lot of problems, but in, in some, the, the Africanists who later formed the PAC were saying that um, South Africa is an African country, and it is the African people who must be the core of the formation of a free nation, and that the African people were their own liberators. Um, and that as people who have a, an emotional commitment to total liberation, should understand that they, they have a, nothing to lose if they take up the leadership themselves, rather than being assisted by others. And that um, the, the African individual had to rid himself or herself of colonial mentality. And that the new nation will be primarily um, be from Cape to Cairo, um, Morocco to Madagascar. The new nation will be a nation of African people throughout the world without any restrictions of the, of, of, of the borders. So these differences uh, created a um, problem in, in, in the country to such an extent that um, uh, the KC believes that uh, the, uh, those who were pursuing the Freedom Charter dictates had missed it altogether. Their concept was that South Africa would have four, four nations, the whites, Indians, Kalats, and, and, and the indigenous people who are uh, Africans in, in, in their camps. We do not agree with that um, because our concept of Pan-Africanism is against tribalism, against colonialism, against imperialism, and that we will define ourselves uh, properly. But to cut the story short, we have come to a position where South Africa has nominal freedom. And that nominal freedom uh, was held by the international community. But that nominal freedom had within it um, uh, serious setbacks for the, the, the true freedom of the African people. So we see that the settler colonialism uh, its entirety has been protected through a legal system that um, is now defined as um, a constitutional democracy. I personally was at, at, at the Cordesa talks and I, I, I was held to a detention under Section 29 of the Internal Security Act um, because we to express yourself at that, at, at that time and talk about the land and talk about the new nation at that negotiating table uh, meant that we were uh, then described and isolate or described as, as, as militants and radicals who wanted to topple and overthrow the, the, the government without following um, legal means. Uh, with uh, other members of the PAC, we were detained at John Foster Square 
and we were facing uh, possible transit challenges. But because we were participating, the PhD took a strategy to participate in the talks, because we could not have a convention that discusses the future of our country without uh, isolating ourselves. It, we, 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 we also um, took a position that fighting must continue. So uh, the PAC took a, a, a position that um, our arm struggle was also an important feature of our struggle. And that we will use every site, including the negotiations themselves, as a site of struggle as a site where we would be able to highlight our issues. Um, but the forces were, 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 were greater than what we thought. Because first, a patriotic United Front, uh, which was uh, supported by the OAU, the Organization of African Unity and the Liberation Committee, uh, which was uh, intended to be led by the PAC and the ANC, it collapsed. It collapsed because we did not agree with the ANC on their approach to negotiations. They had um, uh, discussions with the National Party, the, the settler regime at the time, and, and made deals behind um, closed doors. And we, we, we said we want a transparent and open uh, agreement. That on its own uh, created uh, a, a problem. Um, we, we, we think we also uh, were not very strategic in withdrawing from the, uh, the patriotic front, but the, the, that patriotic front collapsed. Today we are focused on Africa Liberation Day because um, just to say it's Africa Month, just to say it is um, a, a remembrance of the day when the OAU was launched in 1963 is not enough. The, the OAU was itself a compromise uh, between, as it's popularly known, the grouping that were known as the uh, Casablanca group, where um, uh, the Kosa Gejo and others were, and the group uh, and the other groupings generally referred to as the Monrovia group, who um, were adamant that the uh, whilst unity is important, the colonial borders must be kept and that um, the, the various states in Africa must um, uh, be standalone organizations and so on. This was, uh, uh, obviously, Pan-Africanism uh, created um, uh, hostile hostility with imperialism and imperialism in, in, in return created problems and, and, and fought against pan -Africanism. That's where we come from. We have been suppressed. Our leaders have been put in jail. We have been harassed as, as a Pan-Africanist revolutionary movement. Um, we have uh, tried to come up over the years in different forms. Um, uh, we have associated with the, the consciousness uh, movement as it rose, led by Steve Biko uh, and others. We, because of the, 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 the differences um, between the two organizations are not that great. Um, even though um, we have two standalone groups, we, we um, uh, created a working uh, relationship uh, with, with um, cadres of the Black Consciousness Movement. I myself come from the generation of 1976, um, which was uh, groomed by Black Consciousness. So we, 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 we understand very well that um, uh, Pan-Africanism and black consciousness can, can cooperate. In the current leadership of the PAC, um, I served in the uh, prayer side cooperation between ASAPO, the black consciousness organization, and the, and the PAC. The PAC definition of um, a, a united front of patriots is um, is that we should focus on uh, minimum issues that make us unique. And the minimum requirement on, the, on those issues are that we, we agree that um, uh, South Africa, as, as people know it today, is a sham. It's a false liberation. It's a false freedom. 
Yes, there are basic freedoms of movement, freedom of speech, of association, and so on. But the core problem of um, uh, white domination, the core problem of capitalist exploitation, the core problem of um, imperialist um, manipulation uh, still remains. Um, and, and, and these three evil forces must be uh, fought with and destroyed because they create a, a, a stunting of people not to develop into full human beings. I want to make and refer to two examples um, for, for purposes of today's African liberation discussions. The one is that uh, uh, white supremacists have taken a disguise and operate among us behind the scenes and um, are forever dominant without being in, in, in political office. Um, this creates an, an element of neocolonialism, but settler colonialism itself is, is, is really complex and needs to be clearly defined as we go forward. So the first example of our white supremacists is that um, um, whilst racism is not in the statute books, the racist system still exists. The racist, racist system still is a system that retains power of resources. And, and it also exists in society because with colonial mentality, people still believe that without whites being running the country, um, it will all be uh, difficult for, for, for proper government of a liberated society to, to, to run smoothly. This belief is, um, um, in simple terms, slave mentality, colonial mentality. The majority of our people still, still believe in that. That is why instead of responding to uh, issues um, uh, that matter most, people respond to things, they, they, to, to other Africans who are driven by economic conditions in Southern Africa uh, to come to South Africa, uh, to, come, to come here uh, in the country um, uh, and, and, and anger is spewed out against those those people who come here because South Africans or African people here out of uh, colonial mentality do not want to identify with the rest of the world. They do not want to identify with um, Africans throughout the world. They'd rather have the white men dominate them. The, the power and resources that white supremacists have is that they uh, use confidence tricks as confident tricksters, they, 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 they had one of the major uh, characters in the liberation movement to agree to a settlement where the basic resources, material resources like the land were never discussed. And uh, the, the, a draft constitution was made that protected uh, the land through the uh, section 29, which is the property clause, that um, those who have property cannot be removed from them without following the legal processes. Even land that lies fallow and is not used has not been returned to the people because um, out of desperation and uh, hurrying up to seats of power in parliament, we have found that um, uh, and, and, and it's, it's proven that uh, it's a shame government that has no um, clue uh, what, what, how a state operates. And it's easy for elements such as corruption, uh, moral corruption of those in power uh, to seep in and to get destroyed. So this this has, this, this has on the whole, uh, led to people not believing in an, 
uh, an approach where African people can, can um, liberate themselves. So we need a second uh, national liberation program to deal with that. White supremacy um, is, is seen not only through um, issues of the land, that what the, the, the economy is in the hands of um, the whites. They are the ones who have developed, as a people, who have developed from the policies of the, of, of the country uh, from the time when 1994 happened. No longer sanctions, they can continue to operate in the one place they can. Their ill gotten wealth has benefited them more. So the, that is why South Africa is, is, is referred to as a, uh, the most unequal society because um, the reality is staring us in the face. Now, how do we move forward um, as Africans in, 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 in doing this? The, the PAC suffered a, a lot of internal problems. We are not afraid to discuss our internal issues out in the open. But those internal issues um, are, are mostly uh, problems of um, a, a reactionary environment. Revolutionaries have to look beyond the task that is immediate before them uh, and, and approach uh, issues like Sohuke has advised us yeah. on an international level. And an international level for us is to adopt revolutionary pan Africanism, to see ourselves as part of a wider movement. Africa Liber Liberation Day offers us an opportunity to re examine the political environment and link us with the, the broader movement uh, internationally of uh, revolutionary pan-Africanism, where we speak the same language, we speak uh, and have identified the same uh, problems that we have to go through, where we have the same vision and we have, um, um, in a manner of speaking, the same goals of total liberation of the African people. In the same way that um, uh, Ghana, and also uh, here for Kwame Nkrumah said, um, um, without African unity, uh, Ghana's li uh, li uh, freedom is meaningless. We have to go out of our cocoons, out of our myopic approach, and have a, a, a broader international. In the PAC, this, this is the politics um, uh, that we have inherited. Um, uh, we, we sometimes can get out of that, but we, we need Pan-Africanists to, to do that. The PAC took a lot of inspirations from um, uh, W.E.B. Boy um, and others who went to Ghana uh, to promote Pan-Africanism. In the PAC, we have had leaders in the PAC themselves as a, as, as a liberation movement, uh, inspiring other countries and other liberation movement in other areas to, to, to work together. So we, we, and we've seen how that um, unity has been uh, a greater enemy to, to the dark forces. So we are we're not naive. The, the movement for African liberation is a powerful movement, but it is here to stay. We, uh, our immediate concern is to, to deal with settler colonialism in Southern Africa. Our immediate concern is to work with um, uh, Tanzanian masses um, in a unity with, with the people, a unity that also allows us uh, to bring them to the fore with Pan-Africanist ideas so that we isolate um, um, the reactionaries so that we are able to create an environment that would allow us to work in Southern Africa with other countries who are facing similar problems of continued settler colonialism, like in, in, in Namibia, for instance, um, uh, and in, in Zimbabwe, uh, in Mozambique, in Southern Africa, there are many countries that have had these this many difficulties. For us, African liberation 
there is a continuation of the struggle. Anuta continues, even if. Greetings to the All African People's Revolutionary Party leadership and fellow panelists, and of course, brothers and sisters. Let me state the obvious and say that in Azania, we have gone through three stages of colonialism. They are classical colonialism, settler colonialism, and neo-colonialism. Azania is by no means different from our Africa in terms of this political experience. However, you could say that it is not that difficult to wage a struggle against both the classical and settler, form, and settler forms of colonialism because the enemy is distinct, visible, and isolated from the people. The problem arises with the anti-colonial struggle that is anchored on a narrow nationalism that makes no reference to the land reposition, total liberation, and socialism. If by any chance socialism is mentioned, it is only for the sole purposes of sloganeering. In Africa, it is the native bourgeoisie that usually leads those anti-colonial but bourgeois struggles. Frantz Fanon cautions us about true political intentions of this national middle class, which, open quote, constantly demands a nationalization of the economy and of the trading sectors, close quote. This political elite does not have in mind a socialization of the means of wealth creation in a manner that the wealth so created would be equally distributed to the people to eradicate poverty and develop both the country and the people. Says Fanon, open quote, to them, nationalization quite simply means the transfer into native hands of those unfair advantages which are a legacy of the colonial period. Close quote. That is the reason why in South Africa, our Azania, we had billions of rand thrown into the so-called Zondo Commission to investigate corruption and state capture by the political elites hiding in the erstwhile liberation parties. When crime is committed by the ordinary people, the police investigate and simply arrest the culprits to face trial in a court of law. The process changes when the culprits are the ruling elites. Tedious parliamentary processes kick in and lead to the expensive establishment of some commissions of inquiry, which in turn must submit their findings to the very same ruling elites for the determination of action to be taken. Not much ever comes out of such processes. In Azania, classical colonialism metamorphosed into settler colonialism after the colonial powers slaughtered each other in that so-called Anglo-Boer War and agreed to hand over power to their people settled in Azania to misrule our country. Azanians waged a number of land wars under the various leaders within the context of the institution of indigenous leadership. The modern struggles were advanced under the liberation movement, which included the ANC, PAC, and ASAPO, the Azim People's Organization. 
such modern anti-colonial struggles led us to the ushering in of independence and democracy in 1994. Azapo asserts that such 1994 independence was in fact the point at which settler colonialism mutated into neocolonialism. All settler colonialism has done was to take over and was to take cover, sorry, and hide behind the Estwell Liberation Parties and their popular leaders. The wealth and the means to create that wealth remains firmly in the hands of settler colonialists or white people. In other words, it is political independence with no land. It is democracy with no development. It is political power with no economic emancipation. It is freedom with no liberation. Neo-colonialism is, in a sense, an enemyless phase of struggle because the enemy is invisible and hiding behind the native middle class, which is now managing the country and the economy on behalf of settler colonialism or white monopoly capital. When the people are frustrated and angry, they march to the authorities to hand over their memorandum of demands. But they soon realize that they are angrily singing about the dead brothers, malams, and declares of the settler colonialism, while handing the memorandum to their popular leaders with whom they embrace and take selfies and go home and forget. With that said, let me hasten to stress the point that Azania is by no means different from the African continent, of which it is the integral part. You have to take into cognizance that the productive formations like capitalism and structures like modern nation states were invariably imposed upon our Africa through colonialism, racism, and slavery. That is why we should never overemphasize our colonial heritage of nation states over the oneness of the African people in Africa. Be that as it might, the struggle to dismantle neocolonialism stretches from when Africa realized that, that coloniality, as negatively effective as it was, had not been conclusive. In fact, this realization made our forebears aware that there remained pockets of African wisdom that could be used to continue our struggle against colonialism. This point is made here deliberately to underscore two things. First, to illustrate the claim that colonialism has not been conclusive. This we see in the fact that Africans who retained their languages are aware of the resilience of African spirituality, which sustained our forebears and retained knowledge of African medicinal plants and shrubs that gave vitality to our forebears. Second, neocolonialism as a facade of classical colonialism can only thrive when there is a lack of the historicity of the African. Accordingly, a conversation that contributes to pushing back 
the, intrus the intrusion of colonialism in capturing the African must be pivoted on a conversation that remembers the greatness of Africa and her great people. This remembrance should not be reduced and frozen into a past of pillage, maiming and the exploitation of Africa and her people. Therefore, we say boldly as a Zappa that colonialism must be dismantled. The story of the tale of the African cannot and must not be reduced to slavery because we have not always been enslaved as an African people. I find courage in the words of the African scholar, Kofi Asare Opo, when he says the following about our forebears. Open quotes. For many centuries, our ancestors lived here on this continent, grounded in the knowledge and understanding of themselves as a people and of the world in which they lived. Without this knowledge, they could not have survived as a people who created their own unique societies, civilizations and cultures, established states, kingdoms and empires, and came up with their own reflections and insights into the problems of the meaning of life and death. This knowledge was not limited to physical things or their natural environment. It also had to do with these spiritual realities. And above all, they created languages that served as vehicles for the communication of this knowledge and its transmission from generation to generation. But Besides language, other means of transmitting this body of knowledge were devised, including symbols, artifacts, songs, stories, festivals, rituals, and a whole host of other means. Over time, this knowledge became the common intellectual property of our societies until their encounter with other forms of knowledge, which in our day threatens to overshadow the indigenous knowledge of our forebears with our own eager complicity, close quote. <clears throat> this point is made to buttress the fact that Africans have not always been enslaved. Our history should therefore not begin and end with slavery. This is the starting point that will position us to challenge all attempts to disavow our own cultures. Once that is done, we will be on our, on our way to dismantling colonialism with a liberated mind. Furthermore, this admission might discourage us from the eagerness to show our scars to the world, hoping that they will express pity on us. If anything, Africa must positively use her scars to remind herself that she is not where she should be in the development of world history. The scars must be used to rally our warriors into their regiments and fight for the restoration of the humanity and dignity of the Africa. The scars must be used to liberate and heal the African land by returning it to its rightful owners, the Africans. A liberated Africa and restored military might will definitely be of benefit even to the African in the diaspora. The restoration of the might of the motherland will make everyone thinks twice before they could once again treat an African as their slave. 
Africa has enough wealth, both spiritually and materially, and thus Africa abhors the begging bowl mentality that seems to have characterized this great continent under the sterile leadership of the native middle class, which derailed the entire colonial struggle and plundered the resources of the continent for the enduring benefit of their colonial masters. Of course, the native managerial class does get some crumbs thrown into their mouths by their colonial masters for helping to arrest the development of the African people. As we commemorate this African day, we must also take a moment to agree to have a covenant with Africa as Africans. A covenant in contractual language denotes an agreement to place the other in confidence and to see to it that what, what is agreed between parties gets to be realized. It also means allowing space for partners to be critical and self-critical about the issues that hinder our collective growth. That covenant is a vow by the African masses to forge solidarity with the fellow Africans beyond the narrow confines of their nation states. This covenant is a struggle from below by the African masses under the banner of Pan-Africanism. If colonialism is showing its ugly face as imperialism under transnational bodies like the United Nations, International Monetary Fund, World Bank, European Union, NATO, and others, we therefore know that no one country in Africa can fight colonialism in isolation. We also know that the anti-colonial struggle must be freed from the leadership of the African states and be placed in the hands of the fighting African masses. Azapo has no reason whatsoever to look beyond the All Africa People's Revolutionary Party for the leadership and direction of the struggle for land reposition, total liberation, and socialism by the African masses of the continent of our beautiful Africa. It is that pan-African anti-colonial struggle that will push narrow reactionary nationalism and patriotism to the background. The momentum of the struggle will undermine and crash some Afrophobic tendencies underpinned by reactionary patriotism that we have seen in South Africa, our Assami. It is for a reason that Anzapo never ever uses misleading terms like post-colonial. We are not in a post-colonial, but we are in a colonial, neo-colonial state in Azania. You cannot be in a neo-colonial state and still claim to be liberated. <laughs> Amilcar Cabral has been very kind to us by offering a sound description of what national liberation is. Open quote, national liberation takes place when and only when national productive forces are completely free of all kinds of foreign domination. The liberation of productive forces and consequently of the ability to determine the mode of production most appropriate to the evolution of the liberation of the liberated people 
necessarily opens up new prospects for the cultural development of the society in question by returning to that society all its capacity to create progress. Close quote. Comrades, sisters and brothers, we must understand that colonialism is so versatile and enduring that it is able to survive well beyond the strict limits of colonial administrations. That is exactly why coloniality survives colonialism. In that sense, coloniality may be kept alive in books, in the criteria for academic performance, in cultural patterns, in common sense, in the self-image of peoples, in aspirations of the self, and so many other aspects of our modern experience. And so, as we commemorate the Africa Liberation Day, as Zappo says, we are ready for the revolution. Thank you. Incredible, incredible. I hope y'all are on fire the way I am after those two keynote presentations. Um, and with that said, I'm gonna pass us over to the next portion of our African Liberation Day Symposium and pass it along to my comrade, Evelyn. Greetings, peace and revolutionary greetings, Africans. Um, it is my pleasure and honor to facilitate this panel on the role of women fighting for unity against neo-colonialism. Uh, it's, you know, I'm, I'm working with um, the Tory Tribe Work Study Circle of the AAPRP, and this is my I'm about a year and a half into that uh, into that circle and work with the AAPRP, and I really do feel like you know this has been a transforming experience and, and uh, an organization that really recognizes uh, the role and importance of women, um, and also one that recognizes the work that still needs to be done, and I can really appreciate that about the AAPRP. In the words of our beloved. Thomas Sankara, the revolution and women's liberation go together. We do not talk of women's emancipation as an act of charity or out of a surge of human compassion. It is a basic necessity for the revolution to triumph. Women hold up the other half of the sky. These are the words of Thomas Sankara in uh, the book, We Are the Heirs of Revolution. And as our, our panelists will express much better than I um, in just a few moments, uh, you know, the role of, of women and liberation is essential as the role, as is the role of, of all people and all figures, all Africans. Um, and so it's, it's not enough, as his quote said, it's not enough to try to accommodate or make a little space for women. They have to be involved in the movement and in the work from the very beginning, integrated in the work from the very beginning. Um, and there's just no way, you know, for us to, to reach liberation without that factor, without being cognizant of that. And we really have to, you know, hear from women and let women lead, you know, as we look at, you know, these new iterations of colonialism, neo-colonialism, and we think about the ways that imperialism is expanding and the unique and particular ways that women and marginalized genders are directly impacted in so many different ways from our physicality, you know, to the work uh, that we are subjected to or the work that we um, are able to do voluntarily and in a number of other ways. And so it's absolutely central that we always have space 
to hear from women and always make room and let it be a natural thing, actually, for women to lead in the work. On that note, we are going to move to our first uh, panelists. And first, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the organization um, that our studio is coming from. Embelico is a women's organization. It is a formation of the Azanian People's Organization, Azapo. It was established in 1987 for the purpose of addressing the unique struggles of the Azanian women. Azapo recognized that women have unique problems and thus formed a wing that concentrated on women's affairs. And Bellico runs self-help projects such as brick lane, carpentry, and upholstery. There are various health projects and education projects that have been established by the organization and abuse relief fund that has been established to assist students. It is an organization that locates the struggle of black women's liberation within the historical struggle of black people. And Bellico is guided by, among others, the principles of anti-capitalism, anti-colonialism, anti-neocolonialism, and anti-patriarchy. And Bellico understands that the liberation of black people cannot be complete without the liberation of black women. And on that note, I'd like to welcome and hear from comrade Sikizwa Dabua. Thank you to the All African People's Revolutionary Party for hosting this important conversation. And thank you for extending an invite to Imbelego Women's Organization, a women's formation of the Azanian People's Organization, Azapo. I bring you revolutionary greetings from an organization whose leaders and members refuse to sell the struggle for temporal material gains. I greet you in the names of fallen activists whose blood serves as an ultimate sacrifice for the liberation of Azania. I greet you in the names of fellow black brothers and sisters who lie as cornerstones beneath the buildings of European invaders. I greet you in the silent cries of women whose children are sold and trafficked as modern day slaves. I also greet you with a hopeful smile that Azania shall once again be ours. The marking of this 59th anniversary of the African Liberation Day takes place at a very tumultuous time in our country, where fellow Africans are at war with each other, hurting and even killing one another for mere scraps provided by descendants of colonial settlers and foreign capitalists who remain in control of our means of production. A time when the maiming and killing of young women and children is now perpetrated by black men this is the kind of violence and intolerance against one another that has us sitting here today in an attempt to call for a healing of the overexploited African. It is our hope that the healing will unify Africans towards the fight against this inherently anti-Black neo-colonial system. This commemorative event is a painful reminder of the severe impact of our land dispossession and the spiritual castration of Black people. What is Africa Liberation Day to me as a landless young Black woman with no economic power to self-determine? What is liberating about living in fear? Fear of your own people. Today, we raise clenched fists in solidarity with one another and loudly chant, Amantla. But tomorrow, the same fist may be thrown at me for refusing to bow to the patriarchal forces that challenge my existence as a woman. My reality is immersed in the violence arising from the powerlessness of my Black people. This is the violence that threatens our collective progress as a people. This month of May also marks the anniversary of the formal adoption of the 1996 Constitution of the Republic of South Africa. This is the same constitution that has praised the world over for its progressiveness and advancement. One really wonders how progress is measured if the people this constitution purports to represent are landless and impoverished. In fact, 
It is this very same constitution that is used to perpetuate the landlessness of the majority of the citizens of this country. The European invaders made the point of ensuring that this country is governed through a constitutional democracy that favors white liberalism at the expense of black people. In attempting to speak to the role of women against neocolonialism, allow me to borrow from the wise words of the revolutionary leader and president of Burkina Faso, the late comrade Thomas Sankara, when he says, the revolution and women's liberation go together. We do not talk of women's emancipation as an act of charity or because of a surge of human compassion. It is a basic necessity for the triumph of the revolution. Women hold up the other half of the sky. Sankara's counsel should be understood in the context of finding who the black woman is in the struggle matrix and how important she is in the united fight against neocolonialism and the fight for the true liberation of our land and all that belongs to her. History is littered with stories of triumphalism by many a woman warrior. Our African way of life teaches us that women are sacred ancestral beings who ought to be revered as gods. They are the portals through which life is given. Not only do they birth and nurture people to humanity, but they also defend them against any harm. But most importantly, they set and determine the trajectory of the futures of their nations. It was Nkrumah when talking about the successes of their struggle in Ghana who told us, I quote, from the beginning, women have been the chief field organizers. That's good. We also know of brave women warriors like Nkabai Kachama, Ya Asentewa, Mbuyane Anda, and Queen Nzinga, who all have been very instrumental in the fight against the invasion of their nations by the European colonialists. These warriors represent the uncontaminated character and might of black women in Africa. These are the warriors who remind us that no revolution may be successful without the participation of women. It is from understanding the importance of women in society that one is forced to suggest that the economic exploitation of black women in this country and their exclusion and participation and decision making is not only myopic, but remains a grave injustice. In dismantling neocolonialism, the first war that we black women must wage is against accepting the concept of negative reality that makes black women view themselves as inferior victims who can neither care for nor defend themselves against any form of attack, be it personal or societal. This attempt by the system to create in every black woman a helpless, powerless being must be rejected with the disgust it deserves. The second, perhaps most important fight should be rejecting any divisive strategy meant to drive a wedge between the black woman and the black man, as if both are not victims of imperialism, racism, and neocolonialism. Our temporary material conditions are created such that the two remain at odds with each other when they are supposed to be united in the fight against the system of oppression. If we black people contribute knowingly and unknowingly in the persistence of this antagonistic relationship, then we must accept the inevitable death of the black race. Third, we must refuse to allow the system to insinuate black women in the struggles of those who are on the side of the oppressor. Having noted the ease with which neocolonialism as a continuum of colonialism mutates and shapeshifts, it can be understandable why black women find resonance in certain philosophical constructs that are invented to safeguard the efforts of white women in positioning themselves for power. However well-meaning white women may be, they will never return to us our stolen land. However well-meaning white women may be, they will never settle for anything less than being a boss to black women. They will never be part of the healing and restoration of the black family, and they will never sacrifice the luxuries of their comfortable positions in the pyramid of white power. We must remember that our fundamental struggle as black people in this overly exploited settler colony is for the return of our land to its rightful owners. We need the convergence of the forces of our black women and black men to overcome this struggle. If not for ourselves, 
than for future generations of the black race. It is only through this convergence of our united forces as a black race that neocolonialism can be dismantled. Our unity must, without fear or doubt, silence the arrogance of this mutating multifaceted anti-black system. By going back in history to find the unadulterated black woman and black man, and using that as a basis upon which a new liberated being is created, we shall have succeeded in wiping away any trace of the self-mutilating African the colonialists would have created. Wow, comrade. Wow, that was such a powerful speech. That was just, that was amazing. I'm still kind of processing everything that Sister Sisiwe just said. You know, she was mentioning so many vital points for us to be mindful of. And if I could just, you know, recall a couple of the key points that our comrade made, you know, she mentioned the means of production and the way that labor and work exploits Black women in particular. And we know that in, you know, the United States that Black women in particular make less pay than anyone else and are subjected to, to harsh work conditions and things like that when they're engaged in low wage labor. And so I really appreciate the, that uh, point that was made by our comrade. And then also, you know, being mindful of the fact that the experiences of African women across the diaspora are different. They vary. You know, some African women have, have various types of, of privileges, maybe based on their education or their, their social position and some may be more disadvantaged. Some are subjected to, to violence and sexual abuse all the time. Um, and some may even be attacked for speaking out in the way that our comrade just did. So I really appreciate all of those brilliant points that, uh, that you made, uh, City. Thank you very, very much. We are now going to move uh, to our next speaker who is uh, hailing from uh, a union that I am glad to be a part of as well, the All African Women's Revolutionary Union. And so let me tell you a little bit about the AAWRU. The All African Women's Revolutionary Union was founded on November 27, 1980, as the women's wing of the All African People's Revolutionary Party the AAPRP understood that the solution to the many problems facing women is organization and political education. The AAWRU understands that real, lasting freedom for African women is possible only through Pan-Africanism, which the AAPRP defines as the total liberation and unification of Africa under scientific socialism. It is only through the unification of all sectors of our people, African women in particular, that we can reclaim every inch of our land in Africa from the grips of neocolonialism and imperialism. Our demands as African women are inseparable from the object of seizing political and economic power from bourgeois society. African women must come to understand the benefits of socialism to them. It is only through scientific socialism that the development of women is ensured. Consequently, it is only through organization and political maturity that we will arrive at this understanding and mobilize ourselves and our people for the final victory. Edam Richardson has been an organizer with the All African People's Revolutionary Party and the All African Women's Revolutionary Union for two years. She lives in Burkina Faso and is in the Adorpor Kofi Mwabla Nuhanda Work Study Circle based out of Ghana. She is also the director and co-founder of the Thomas Sankara Center for African Liberation and Unity, a revolutionary Pan-African library and Political Education Center in Ogadugu, Burkina Faso. Welcome, Comrade Inam. Okay, greetings. Thank you so much for having me. Um, hopefully you can hear me all right. Um, okay, um, happy African Liberation Day. 
Um, so I pre-wrote some stuff that I'm going to share because I just prefer to uh, share that way. So I was asked to talk about women fighting for Pan-African unity against neocolonialism. Uh, but one of the things that came up on our call when I was preparing for this was neocolonialism as an inherently patriarchal system of exploitation. So I want to begin by talking about the ways in which neocolonialism is inherently patriarchal. As you may know, colonialism and neocolonialism impact every facet of life for colonized people. So there's no way to analyze any aspect of our lives while ignoring the reality of neocolonialism and imperialism. But since neocolonialism is fundamentally an economic system, I want to begin by focusing on how the neocolonial economic relationship between the African worker and the local and or international bourgeoisie leads to forms of oppression and exploitation that are gendered and that impact men and women in different ways. So the first thing I want to state is that in the African continental context, as well as in other parts of the world, a neo-colonial economy is an extremely extractive economy. African economies are extractive economies dependent on the exportation of raw materials and for many states, uh, especially reliant um, on, in particular on the exportation of petroleum and minerals. Perhaps only second to agriculture, mining and resource extraction is the cornerstone of many African economies. Nigeria is heavily reliant on crude oil exportation. Ghana and Burkina Faso and Mali are heavily reliant on their gold extraction. Niger has been historically dependent on the exportation of uranium. For Botswana, it is diamond mining. For Azania, uh, which if you don't know is South Africa, the economy today is a little more mixed and industrialized, but if you focus on the indigenous non-settler population, you still see a dependence on mining with too many minerals coming out of Azania to list here. Of course, the largest concentration in min of minerals in the world are found in the Democratic Republic of Congo, as well as in the Central African Republic. I want to highlight how dependent African countries are on resource extraction within this conversation on neocolonialism and gender, because this is such a significant sector of the economy that enforces a very rigid gender division of labor. The first thing I want to state outright is that we must understand that while women are often indirectly barred from participating in one of the largest sectors of the African economy, the men within the mining sector are by no means in an enviable position here. Work within the neocolonial economy is based on the super exploitation of the African worker. So the male workers, unlike the typically male European CEOs of the mining companies, are also oppressed by patriarchal and imperialist extractive capitalism. However, I do want to focus especially on how women are impacted by this, because in some ways that might be a little less obvious here. The first thing that, that I can say about this is that much like colonialism, neocolonialism can be very destructive to the African family. Much like during the colonial period, the neocolonial period forcibly or co coercively separates men from the rest of their families, uh, sorry, as they often must migrate to wherever they can find work. Women do this as well, though because several uh, significant sectors of the economy are closed off to them, men are more likely to move for work as their wives and children stay behind in the cities and villages. We also see this form of migration on an international level as the resources of Africa flow overwhelmingly towards the West. We see that normally, though not at all exclusively, the migrants that take the risky voyages across the Sahara or who attempt to leave the Sahel via boat, whether from Senegal or from North Africa, tend more often to be men. In the Sahel region of Africa, this is actually pretty obvious and visible. It is common to meet women whose husbands live far away, whether in a small mining town elsewhere or in Europe. The men usually do send whatever money they can back home to provide for their families as much as they can, but it is usually never enough. The women are often put into positions where they also need to work outside of the home. Women's work and men's work within the neo-colony are markedly different. Here in Burkina Faso, it is a given. You can see signs on the streets of Ouagadougou that will state, we are looking for women to work for us, followed by a phone number. The type of work is usually not specified because it is implied. Women are specifically sought to work as cooks, cleaners, and waitresses. These jobs are specifically reserved for women, particularly work as cooks and cleaners, with men being either directly or indirectly barred from these fields which represent devalued labor. The overall way that labor is divided leads to the double or triple exploitation of women because women must work within the home as well as outside of the home. They are responsible for childcare, cooking, cleaning, and more or less all other forms of domestic work at home, 
and then they must um, work outside of the home, sometimes carrying out these same forms of labor uh, in, ho in the homes of others. Men often cannot or will not contribute to work within the home evenly or sometimes at all. For some men, this is because they are physically separated from their wives and children due to the structure of the neo-colonial economy and the types of work made available to them. The one thing that really does ease women's burden in this case is that often in these situations, the women will either live with their family or extended family or with their husband's families or extended families. So we don't see a lot of the single parent phenomenon that we might see in the imperialist core here because childcare and domestic responsibilities are sometimes collectivized among extended family unit, units or even within neighborhoods and villages. However, because men are more likely to work in a relatively more valued sector of the economy, even if it is extremely exploitative work, even when they are physically available to share domestic responsibilities, their work is seen as outside of their purview and they won't contribute. In Burkina Faso, this is usually pronounced pretty directly since many people, whether men or women, will state that women are naturally better suited for housework and that men should be able to maintain their position as the head of the household by being the primary provider of money. Though as I already pointed out, women are working outside of the home as well. It is only if there's a fundamental economic change in Africa that these oppressive gender dynamics can change. And this fundamental, and this fundamental economic change can only occur, occur if workers in Africa seize the means of production and if Africa can find a pathway to some form of industrialization. There's so much that I have not even had the chance to touch upon here, but just to briefly point out, one of the reasons why there is such a huge reliance on the exploitation of domestic workers is in part because of the lack of industrialization and access to modern appliances throughout various parts of the continent. The working classes in the urban areas will often purchase the domestic labor of working women in the villages because it is really very hard for a man and a woman to work outside of the home, to have five or six children between the two of them, and to have access to very few modern appliances. The domestic, uh, the domestic labor that they purchase often substitutes for the vacuum cleaner, laundry machine, or dishwasher that they do not have access to. Of course, if men begin to contribute to domestic responsibilities to the best of their abilities, the level of domestic exploitation will decrease. However, only socialism and industrialization can truly change the inherently patriarchal conditions created by neocolonialism. This can only succeed in a unified Africa. We have already seen it attempted in a divided Africa. Socialism, socialism brought enormous strides to women's emancipation in Burkina Faso while it lasted. However, socialism in a divided Africa tends not to last very long. Men need to be re-socialized not to view domestic work as inherently feminine so that women have the time and ability to contribute to building a unified socialist Africa. This will emancipate both the men and the women from oppressive and exploitative work. So that, um, that's what I prepared. Thank you. <laughs> Asante sana, comrade Inam. Um, thank you very much to both of our, our panelists for the knowledge, for the way you articulated, you know, the struggle in particular parts of the world and all over the world and throughout the diaspora. And um, we haven't had enough. We want to hear more from you, from each each of you, Inam and uh, and comrade Sikwe. And so I want to ask. Um, both of our panelists some questions. Um, and the first, and either of you could, could take this, Inam or, or, or Comrade uh, Sizikwe, um, or, or both of you, if you feel so inspired. Um, but the first question that I want to ask you, comrades, is what are what do you see as the barriers to recruitment and retention of African women and youth? in Pan-African organizations and the fight for unity. And I can repeat that if you if you need me to, I'll, I'll ask it one more time. What are the barriers to recruitment and retention of African women and youth in Pan-African organizations and the fight for unity? Now, if Inam wants to take that, take that one. Okay, I could take that. Um, so, to give an example of an experience I had recently that's coming to mind. So um, we've had numerous orientation sessions and events that um, 
that we've hosted out here for the All African People's Revolutionary Party. Um, so, you know, different film screenings, different sorts of events and orientation sessions. And uh, out here, we tend not to get a lot of participation from the women. Um, and recently, we actually had um, a woman participate in an AAPRP orientation session for the first time out here. And I, uh, I remember I, I was talking to her about, you know, how can we get more women to come and why, why aren't women showing up as much? Um, I would say that you know pan-Africanism and, and politics here in general is a bit of a boys' club, even though there is this uh, revolutionary history of um, under the during the time of Thomas Sankara, women being elevated to high positions. It's also a country that uh, has experienced now like 30 years of counter-revolution. So um, one of the things that she was saying to me was that. Um, a lot of women feel, or a lot of the men uh, also feel that, like if if the women are participating in politics, that they won't be uh, they won't be considered desirable as partners. Um, that they'll feel that there's there uh, there's a level of threat to them in, within their households. That they'll feel that the uh, the women might be more educated than them, or that the women won't have time to balance um, doing political work and also fulfilling domestic responsibilities. Um, so this young woman in the orientation. Um, her argument was that we need to show women that they can be part of Pan-Africanism and also that men can still be the head of a household. So I think that that also shows that like we need to uh, do a lot of work around some of the, uh, like some of how we're socialized to view gender and women. Um, and I just want to point out a couple of resources in particular that I have really, really found helpful here. So Thomas Sankara is, uh, it's amazing how relevant his works are and because it's his, his country I can reference him so easily here and people will be like okay yes that's true like he made some points here um, so of course um, what is it uh, women's emancipation and the African freedom struggle by Thomas Sankara and another work that I just find so so relevant here in Burkina Faso relevant to the point where I, I want to translate it into French because I think it speaks so much to um, to this context here is actually a book by Frelimo. It's called The Mozambican Woman in the Revolution. Um, I think that that book would, would really, really resonate on the ground in terms of, terms of some of the things that they talk about uh, that is a, a pretty common reality for women here, not universal by any means, but still things that um, are not super uncommon struggles here. So things like really young marriages, uh, coercive or forced marriages, and um, yeah, those are those are like some of the things that uh, make it really hard sometimes to recruit women because there's still very much um, it it's still very much there's an idea that <clears throat> the primary role and responsibility of women is still um, domestic uh, work within the household. Brilliant, you know. That was a really great uh, response. It's just, it's amazing how, you know, we can have all of this, you know, centuries of technological development and science, scientific advancement and all these, you know, transformations over over time. Um, but still, you know, these very rigid ideas about about gender remain and they're, they're really hard to, to get rid of. Um, so I appreciate you speaking directly to that, um, those very toxic um, ideas that, you know, we all have to kind of, you know, um, remind ourselves and check ourselves because we've all gone through these the socialization process where we're taught those things. Um, but thank goodness, you know, we are, are raising generations and we are, you know, hopefully examples of, um, of a change um, that will come in the near future. Um, I have another question for you, comrade. <laughs> uh, and along the same lines, uh, just thinking about, you know, the unique role that women and youth play in the movement. Uh, and that is my, my question. What do you think is the you know um, specific and unique revolutionary role that women and youth play in this struggle as it relates to you know neocolonialism or to you know African liberation in general. But what 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 are some of those kind of particular things that you think women and youth bring uh, to the struggle? Okay, I'm going to touch on that, but I also wanted to talk just really quickly because you mentioned sort of like the uh, major technological and scientific strides that we've made um, over the past you know, decades and centuries and so, but I think we also have to understand that, uh, you know, a lot of the, the like, 
Right. How do I explain? Like the the socialization around women and gender is also you know directly tied to the material conditions and material reality here, and so you know maybe we have made tremendous strides um, in terms of some of the technology that we have access to, but kind of like what I was touching on before, if we don't have access to this technology here, if Africa is unindustrialized, and if there's um, there's just there's not going to be a technology transfer happening in any sort of way that also perpetuates these same material conditions because. Um, in some cases, we do need to have at least one person at the home that's staying around and washing, you know, hand washing the clothes or, you know, cooking every day because there's not a fridge at the house. Um, so if that's like the reality here, it's normally going to be women because of the, how the economy is centered. Um, you know, men are going to be recruited into the mines um, or other forms of like hard labor and of that sort of nature. And, and it's going to be women usually who are going to um, without the technology being accessible here, with the material conditions being what it is, going to stay in the house and perform these forms of labor. So just to kind of, sorry, I know that was the question you just asked, but I did want to touch on it. No, I appreciate that. That was really important. Thank you. I, yeah, I think, oh, oh sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I had a bit of difficulty um, Connecting. I mean, I'm a mother, so I had to quickly run and breastfeed my son. Um, you know, those are the challenges and uh, the kind of balances one really has to sort of make um, as an activist, but also as a mother. Um, you spoke of the uniqueness of the woman in, in the struggle towards the liberation. Look, um, as, I, as I said earlier, um, my understanding of women, especially Black women in particular, is that we are very sacred beings, we are very spiritual beings, um, and, and that's where our ancestors entrust, that, entrust us with the foresight, you know, um, the, the wisdom to foresee things, the wisdom to guide um, our people to, to take the right path. So if our Black people were to attempt um, any fight, really, to achieve anything progressive for the Black masses, they would really have to deeply consult um, um, the black woman. And you see the black woman in very key spaces, you know, um, in, in indigenous leadership, they are there. You see them in the churches providing leadership. You see them providing visionary leadership. And if you were to go as far as in the 1800s in South Africa, for example, you would find Uma Mumkabai Gajama, who was a military leader and who had the foresight to go to, to her father and said, look, um, I know you have this wife who gave you two girl children already, but our monarch is at stake. You know, our Zulu kingship is at stake and you need a son. So Umkabai being a child went and looked um, for a wife so that the father can marry and then give birth to a son. And that was the case. A son was born, Musenza Makwana was born to the father. And thus the Zulu kingdom was able to continue through the foresight of a young woman who was Unta Baigacham, through the foresight of the visionaries of the ancestors through a young black woman. So I think we've, we play a very important role um, in, in, in the struggle of the liberation of black people. We play a very important role in safeguarding the future of, of black people and our children. So I think it, 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 it goes without saying that the liberation of, of Black people can never be possible without our own emancipation and participation as Black women. Asante's not a comrade. Um, yeah, beautifully said, beautifully said. Um, and it kind of you know, brings me to another um, thought that is perhaps connected to some aspects of what you said, and also, you know, some things that Inam mentioned, and I am curious, um, you know, to know what that looks like, right, in your part of the world, because as, you know, was mentioned, I think, earlier in this panel, you know, across the diaspora, women are having different experiences based on their particular realities, based on the social structure of their society and the political structure of their society, etc. And so I'm curious about um, what you all think about social entrepreneurship or if you have thought about thought about that at all, uh, you know, in the United States, we have this whole, you know, uh, support black businesses, you know, um, 
motto that uh, has a lot of problems, you know, laden in it. Um, I understand the, the foundation of it, you know, that we want to support small, you know, businesses and support our community and make sure that money circulates within our community like it does many other ethnic groups, but um, that doesn't free us, you know, making individual um, businesses and companies more rich for their own sake doesn't free all of us. What is the collective good? And so, you know, along the lines of social entrepreneurship, business or economic, economic opportunities develop specifically to solve social issues and positively impact communities. And these are things that could, could dismantle neocolonialism. What do y'all think about the, the viability of that or the, um, the impact and use of, of that, of those sort of uh, projects? Thank you. Um, I think in Azapu, for example, we have a, a, a long-standing program or project, if you like, that is called Stretch the Rent. So the purpose of that is, is, is to do exactly what you're saying, to support Black businesses um, and, and projects in their various spaces. So we, being the majority um, of, of people in this country, you know, unlike Black people in America, for example, um, this kind of project, if done correctly, can definitely move our people from, you know, this point of being impo impoverished or, or under, um, under, oh, what's the term? Okay, let's say from the point of being impoverished. So it can move us from there to a point of self-reliance and econ economic em emancipation, if done correctly, you know. Um, so, so I think it's a great program. Yes, we do that in many other programs. Um, so I, I feel like it, it's a program that needs to be strengthened, um, intensified, so that it, it benefits, um, you know, women, it benefits young people, and it benefits us as a, as a race. If, if done properly, I think it, it has a potential of, of making a huge, huge economic change. Thank you. Thank you for that, comrade. Um, Inam, did you want to speak to that? To that question as well. Or? Okay, sure. And I think um, I can almost sort of touch on the previous question a little bit here too, um, just to say that you know um, women, even he, like if they're not as directly involved, particularly here in um, Pan Africanism, in the same way that men are, um, women have always been engaged in class struggle, have always been um, struggling for the liberation of uh, their people, their communities, and this continent. Uh, so one of the things that comes to mind, particularly when you talk about social entrepreneurship, um, a lot of women are here are involved in production. So I think of how uh, Bertina Faso is one of the biggest producers of shea butter and how it's largely it's um, primarily women who are often working in some sort of cooperative form who are um, at the forefront of, uh, of production in this sector. Um, I think it can Provide short-term emancipation, and I think it's necessary for you know, like if we're going to be building pan-Africanism, we need to have some sort of um, some some sort of financial situation to you know finance our organizations, finance our struggle, and also just to survive as a people. Um, but I don't think that there's going to be any concrete sort of large changes if um, you know under this sort of extractive capitalism or any form of capitalism. Um, and I think that Africa needs to industrialize. And I think in order for that to happen, it needs to unify. Um, and it needs to unify under socialism with workers um, controlling production that everyone, you know, the means of production. So. Yes, that makes that makes perfect sense. Only we can we can just you know operationalize everything that y'all are saying. It seems like we're we're knocking at the door, you know, to, to liberation. Like these are exactly the things that we need to do. Um, and the next question is kind of related, I, I think, to this. This is all kind of flowing together. Um, but this is a question about revolutionary ideology and the significance of having, you know, revolutionary ideology and being principled uh, in the work toward liberation. So how can revolutionary ideology help African people to achieve Pan-Africanism um, and, and ultimately liberation and, you know, by a way of, of, of scientific socialism? What is the, the significance of, of having a revolutionary ideology? I can just say, um, I don't think we're getting anywhere without an ideology. Um, I think that, um, 
ideology helps us understand what we're doing and why and what, what our objective is and what the purpose is. And also um, it allows us to look at you know, concrete examples uh, historically of what's worked and what hasn't worked. Um, so I think you know, ideology in a way is everything. I mean, we need practice as well. It's not just, just all theory, but we can't really practice without theory. Um, you know, we're not going to get very far. So, um, and I think this also is very much like what I was touching on before uh, when I was talking about some of our struggles to recruit women. You know, it's an ideological struggle, uh, which is why I talk about how, you know, we need to reference Thomas Sankara or we need to translate the works from Frolimo or from the PIGC specifically when from the uh, women revolutionaries that dealt with similar um, these uh, similar forms of patriarchy. So I think, you know, it's, um, it, it's an ideological struggle, um, even to get women to participate um, in this sort of way, at least in this context. Um, I, I think without a, a clear politically grounded ideology, um, it will be difficult to even attempt um, to start a revolution because you would be you wouldn't be able to locate you know the basis of your struggle you wouldn't be able to locate who the enemy is who the target is who the objective is so I think a grounded political ideology is critical for anyone attempting any type of revolution particularly black women um, because you know as as mentioned before our struggle is unique our struggle. Um, some may, be re may reference it as threefold, our struggle is multifaceted. So it's, 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 it's very possible and, and quite easy um, for, for some of us um, to, to be insinuated in other people's struggles. And if we do not go back to our political grounding, to our ideological grounding, we may then very well find ourselves following each and every one. Um, and then at the end, finding that we are not fighting for the same cause, we are not fighting for the same objective. So it's critical that there is a very clear and, and political ideological set of principles that ground each and every movement, especially that of Black women, if they wish to find themselves liberated in this day and age. Right on, right on. Uh, much appreciation and gratitude uh, to the comrades, Zikwe Inam. Thank you so much for your contributions uh, tonight. And, um, Y'all have a good, a good evening. Take care. A luta continua and for it ever. Equate never. La patria le mort, nous vaincrons. Thank you. Africa's recital, heart to heart, searching, I ask, dearest Mama Africa, how are you doing? Then thoughtfully she recites, oh darling son of the soil, I saw this coming, the how am I doing? is a burden like a boulder on my shoulder that I have been carrying from long ago. My cold story has been told, somehow sold like gold to young and old. Even generations to come will want to know. Check your history, it will tell. How I yell for help in my hell hole cell situation articulating the age of European discovery spell that left me lingering in a blazing, mind-boggling jail, the blow out of foreign behavior and far-off belief, demonizing everything else, even the life I live. I spit and cast a curse 
on boats of the wicked ones, those that waters unknowingly carried to my seashores. The how am I doing is really hard to express without fuming with bitterness, recalling the birth of colonization madness, a malicious agenda of perverted, immoral, mindless missionaries. The legalization of looting and weeping that left me cataleptic. Yes, I mean lifeless. Look, I still bear scars, mutilations tattooed on my naked skin from the soles of my feet up to my broken skull for one and all to see. The launching of slavery with its vicious, lynching soul anguish. Nightmares have invaded my dream cosmos. I hear echoes of bitterly tortured masses. I feel chains and shackles choking me to death. I want to live and lead, but I can't breathe. Freedom is a dream I would like to end my sleepless nights. The how am I doing? Is a loud bell ringing in my ears, a big bang of a drum warning the nation, a thunderous voice shouting, African children, African children, African children, reminding me of how bad I feel about the notorious Berlin conference where I was once more bullied, where I was once more stripped naked, where I was once more gang raped, and where I was finally sliced into palatable shreds. Now, on my flesh and blood, they all feed belly full. I am their dreamland of milk and honey. From their molestation, my womb carries monsters that are called ministers. Sucking my ever-engorged breasts while their alien dads starve you to death. Your loss is their gain. Now you know. Go tell the world, how am I doing? Revolutionary greetings. The Democratic Party of Guinea African Democratic Rally was founded on May 14, 1947, and was the decisive force in the victorious fight against and in the building of the Guinean nation. Through the ups, downs, and curves of revolutionary struggle, the PDG RDA stands. And on this African Liberation Day, it is our honor to present the Kwame Ture Black Star of Labor Award to the PDG RDA, the Democratic Party of Guinea African Democratic Rally. The PDG has blazed the revolutionary trail, modeling for us organizational discipline collective leadership with the almighty people at the front, the full participation of women, and the resolute determination to achieve a unified socialist Africa. The names of PDGRDA ancestors ring in our revolutionary hearts. Ahmed Sekuture, Haja Mafori Bangura, El Haj Biro Kante, Haja Aminata Ture, Comrade Kwame Ture, and so many others who guide us through their lasting legacy of work and study and struggle for the people. We have not forgotten the quest and the fight to bring home Muhammad Ture, and we are with you in this fight. We honor you today, Democratic Party of Guinea, African Democratic Rally, as we present you with the Kwame Ture Black Star of Labor Award.
Aluta continua, prête pour la révolution, ready for revolution. Greetings, 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 Africans. All right, all right. Do we feel fired up? Are we ready to go? Are we ready to smash neo-colonialism? Happy African Liberation Day 2022. I would like to take this time to thank all of our facilitators of the panels. I want to thank all of our panelists. So we heard from our Cuban comrade family. I want to give a shout out to all of our awardees. Congratulations. Thank you so much for all of the work you all have done. Again, to remind you, we gave awards to the National Union of Eritrean Women. We gave an award to our comrade, Teodora Gomez, and they both earned the Moana Kayate Award. We also gave an award to our comrade Nia Ardo with the AAPRP Legacy Award. Special shout out to our panelists, uh, Ajamu Baraka from the Black Alliance for Peace. Thank you again to our other comrade, Chance Imad from the Palestinian Youth Movement. We want to also give a shout out to our panelists for the Pan African Women's Union our comrade Shiwaka Dawula and our comrade Anim Richardson. We also wanna give thanks to our comrades who put on today's presentation. Thank you to all the folks doing work behind the scenes. Thank you to our audience members. Please be sure to join us tomorrow for part two of African Liberation Day. We will be live streaming the African Liberation Day March and rally and it's going to be live from Guinea-Bissau, so you don't want to miss it. Make sure you join our AAPRP YouTube channels. You can also join on Facebook. We also have a Twitter page. There are three different ways that you can join in and watch the African Liberation Day celebration continue tomorrow from Guinea-Bissau. Again, we give a special thanks to our awardees, a special thanks to our panelists, as well as our facilitators, to everyone who understands that we need to smash neo-colonialism. We thank you. And if you are not in an organization working for justice, after hearing all of the speakers from today's event, we strongly suggest that you find an organization that is working for justice immediately, because smashing neo-colonialism is not something that can happen with one person. It's not something that can happen with 20 people. It is something that is going to take all of us. As we heard from our comrades earlier today, the reason that we did not just have speakers from the AAPRP is because we as a party understand that joining a organization working for justice is still better than no one being in an organization. So we have people from the Black Alliance for Peace who are in cahoots with us because they understand that we need to organize together. We have people from the Palestinian youth movement because they understand coming to ALD to speak that we all need each other's support to help address the issues that don't just affect Palestinians and don't just affect indigenous people, but they affect Africans and the oppressors that affect Africans affect indigenous people and Palestinians and so on and so forth. So we must remember, we not only need to smash neocolonialism and we all need to do that, but we need to smash patriarchy. We need to smash homophobia and other systems of oppression that are affecting people everywhere get access to their land having it back and having control of their resources. Congratulations for a 2022 African Liberation Day. We welcome you, we appreciate you for joining us and we hope that we will see you tomorrow and join an organization working for justice. Amandala Awetu, Izweletu, E Africa. Woo! Yes.